use of the mother form, especially in the arms and in the legs. And these are really, really helpful in, in blocking out, simplifying what's really complicated. So the drawing course by Charles Barg is one of my favorite drawing books of all time. Not only does it have like really great uh, beginning cast drawings to work from, but it also has a section on figures as well. So I'm gonna do a plate, Roman numeral three, number 27. So if I don't mess it up really bad, I think it'll be a really good practice. Um, probably take about 10 to 15, maybe 20 minutes, depending on the size that you draw. Uh, typically these were meant to be drawn in the same size that they were originally drawn, which again was four times the size, and it was expected to take uh, I think at minimum 15 hours and the idea was to make an exact copy as possible I'm going to use Charles Barg's drawings as a way to practice the figure drawing um, From life that's I'm going to try to use these as a guide and help me to understand some of these overlapping forms the overall position of the head to the foot the balance the gesture and just the overall structure of the, of the, uh, the human figure so hopefully Charles Barg doesn't turn in his grave and an angry mob comes for me for violating a sacred text as this. But um, basically I'm just gonna use these as a nice little study, warm ups. And again, there's like 60 or so uh, poses to choose from. So there's plenty to work with and, and uh, to have fun with. So let's uh, go ahead and get started on these. Charles Borg, Barg, Borg, Barg. I keep, <laughs> I keep mispronouncing his name. It's Barg, Charles Barg, 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 Barg. So it's really fun to draw from the Borg drawings because we're basically doing master copies and he's already done all the hard work for us. He's drawn these out from uh, a model or maybe it's invented, but either way, he's done all the work. He's, did a, he's done all the design. So all we have to do is copy it and just uh, through the copying, we get to really appreciate the, uh, the subtleties of the form and design. And here you can see I'm trying to find the halfway point from the top of the head uh, to the bottom of the foot. So I use the crotch as a general rule being the halfway point between the top of the head and the foot in the standing pose and right at the crotch. So that plus sign is right about where the crotch will be. And then from there, I'm gonna pull that nice rhythm line. And I also like to count seven heads high. So I'll take the, the length of the head, I'll count down to three and a half, and I'll place that mark for the, uh, the crotch. And that will be my halfway point from the top of the head to the foot. It'll change if it's a seated pose or if the pose is twisting and, and bent over or something like that. But in general, uh, I use the crotch as halfway point. So stopping here, you can really see how first we did the head position and to the shoulder. And then of course, all the way down to the foot. So first we had the head and shoulders, and then we did the, uh, the head placement in relationship to the weight bearing foot. That main rhythm. And then of course, we did the, uh, the mother forms. And you can kind of see I hinted at that block shape for the, uh, for the hips. So you don't have to draw them all in completely don't have to think about the three-dimensional form necessarily. You can just think about it solely as a uh, block shape, as a uh, just a simple two-dimensional box or a circle. And then coming in and finishing off that main leg, and you'll see I'll come in and do a nice S-curve sweep. Again, talking about the CSI, um, those are really simple ways of looking at the different types of lines. And uh, so let's go ahead and then continue. So next I'm going to map out the uh, that weight bearing leg, uh, overall rhythm, that really big sweeping S curve. And then I'm going to look for the halfway point between the crotch and the bottom of the foot. And that's going to help me locate the, uh, the kneecap. Now you like to sit the kneecap right on top of that line or just, just touching the line. It's not exactly on the halfway mark but it's just slightly above. So here I got a little ahead of myself and started doing the contours and the uh, anatomical indications with the overlapping lines, but then I kind of got a hold of myself and, and decided to go back up into the arm and just look at those basic structures, the basics 
of the mother forms, the cylinders and the arms. And the cylinders really help to uh, simplify what's very complicated. And then afterwards you can go in and start adding in some of the muscles, the triceps and the biceps. So here I use some of those overlapping mother forms I was talking about before, especially in the upper arm and then in the lower arm, the forearm, you get this nice cylinder. And those really help to uh, build up the structure of the figure. And you can do them throughout. You can just make a practice of it, maybe draw on top like I'm doing here, or just try to invent um, just from imagination and use like a nice cylinder for the upper leg, one for the bottom. And when you get into the areas of like the knee or the elbow, you can practice using like cubes to fill those in. Because again, in ge generally when you get into the knee or in the elbow or any other place that's got a bony structure, you're gonna use more of a, a blocky shape, uh, more angular. Whereas in the muscly areas, you can use like these really fat cylinders depending on the shape, something like that where it's like curving around, you got a lot of muscles. Maybe you got like these different kind of muscles going through. But uh, on the bony structure, you can rely, rely on these straight lines and these uh, three-dimensional blocks. And it, it's really helpful. So drawing the hands and drawing the feet can be really frustrating, especially from these beautiful plates in this book. You have to understand that these plates were originally four times the size of the book when it was first introduced to the market back in the 1800s. They were called full folio sheets and they're very large drawings. So when you look at them in the book, they're actually shrunk down. Um, again, these are supposed to be four times their, their size that we see now today. So there's gonna be a lot of detail, a lot of fine, fine line work that you're just you're desperately trying to uh, capture in your drawing. And if you're drawing it the size that I am, which is probably, I don't know, maybe like uh, 15, uh, maybe 18 inches tall. But uh, even still, it's, it's gonna be very difficult to get that, that really subtle line work. So just take your time with it. Don't, don't try to get every single line in detail and just look for the overall concept of the drawing with the mother forms, the rhythms, the, the structure, and the, uh, the proportions. That's what's important here. So can you see I uh, kind of indicated those asymmetry lines just to help me think about the flow of the pose where you have the muscle on one side and then the muscle on the other side and they're not symmetrical, they're not fighting each other basically because a lot of times when we first start drawing uh, figures and myself included when I first started I would draw the muscles kind of bulging on both sides right at the same point and it really just makes the the pose look funny and and it doesn't flow it, it hinders the flow so if you were drawing an arm you have like the deltoid here and then you have your tricep but it sits pretty high then it comes down to the elbow right and over here you'll have your bicep and the bicep's going to bulge pretty much down at the bottom really close to the forearm and so what you see you get this nice angle and the same with the forearm as well you get a nice little angle so there's a nice flow going on whereas when you have the the muscles bulging on both sides it just it hinders the flow and it's just not set in a natural way because the human body is kind of really interesting because it's stacked on top of it itself in an asymmetrical way and it creates a lot of power and strength and and if you draw it like kind of symmetrical it actually hinders the flow of the entire pose so just look for those little angles and think about that while you're drawing i highly recommend if you can to zoom in real close on some of these plates because they're really beautiful you can see close up his lines often look energetic. They look like they're done with like a, a brio as if they were done with a flick of the wrist. And the overlapping lines are just beautiful and they emphasize the foreshortening by showing one anatomical form in front of the other. And then at the same time, like looking at the entire figure altogether, we can feel the pose in our own body, like the unifying gesture in the poses. 
they show the twist of the hips, the stretch of the neck, and you can just feel it just by viewing the drawing. It's like magic. It's, it's enchanting. I think it's really important not to skip over this part of the book. Uh, it really teaches a lot about the, the gesture of the drawing, the anatomical landmarks, and structure. I mean, each of his figures has a singular gesture rhythm that connects the anatomical landmarks and it just, just gives a flow and a feeling to the drawing and the pose. It's just really beautiful. Okay, so just to run down what we did today, we started off the basic head structure and its relationship to the shoulder. And we're using mother forms in these basic shapes. And then I'll, I also wanted to look for the placement of the head in relationship to the weight-bearing foot. That's really important. That keeps the pose, keeps the, uh, the figure from looking like it's tipping over. Uh, so you want to look for the, uh, the placement of the head in relationship to the weight-bearing foot. And you can use a vertical line, a plumb line, to find that relationship. If we looked at the overall rhythm of the pose running through the entire pose from the pit of the neck all the way down to the foot. And it really locks everything together and gives an overall rhythm and gesture of the pose. And next I came in and I just did a basic ellipse for the, uh, the rib cage and a little indication of the hips with a kind of like a, a square or a rectangle. And then I talked a little bit more about use of the mother form, especially in the arms and in the legs. And these are really, really helpful in, in blocking out, simplifying what's really complicated. We talked about the CSI. So three types of lines. One is a C curve, then we have an S curve and a straight line. You can see that right here, the nice, nice C curve. Then you have your really long S curve and then the straights. And oftentimes the straights will be in and around like the knee, the elbows, and the wrist all kinds of like uh, bony areas. So that's CSI. And then finally I talked about asymmetry in the body, particularly down here in the calf muscles and the ankles and up here in the, the top of the arm. So it's really important to think about asymmetry when you're uh, drawing the outlines of the muscles and not to make them symmetrical because it really disrupts the flow. So give these a try and have fun with it. There's about 60 or so uh, figure plates to draw from in the book. And it's really worthwhile to pick up a book if you can. If you don't have the money, you can definitely find the uh, PDF files online. Or just like through Pinterest, there's a bunch of uh, copies of the uh, plates as well. I'm currently working on a figure drawing course that will be coming out in the near future. And I also have two portrait drawing courses. One focuses on the anatomy and the other one is on the fundamentals of portraiture uh, with the head construction and the rhythms of the face. So check those out if you can. Uh, they're really good deals at $87 for each course and it comes with three full-length demos at the end. So thanks again guys and have fun. Bye.